Hello and welcome to the webinar of Wirt Electronic ISOs. My name is Stefan Helwig and I am the moderator of today's webinar. We are very pleased that you took the time to participate in our webinar. Our speaker today is our product manager Ismail Molina. He will hold today's webinar on when black magic disappears EMI solutions and also answer your questions. Before we start with the webinar, a few organizational notes. You will be muted during the webinar. This means that you can't ask us questions via the microphone, but you can use the chat function to ask the speaker questions at any time. You will find the chat function in the webinar control panel. If you have any technical problems, I will also be available for the entire duration of the webinar via the chat function. The webinar will be about 30 minutes long. The questions asked in the chat will be answered in a question and answer session after the webinar. A further 15 minutes are scheduled for this. If these 15 minutes are not enough to answer all your questions, our speaker will contact you later. If you still have a question in the day after the webinar, please send us an email to our email address isos-webinar at we-online.com. We will try to answer all the questions as soon as possible. At the end of the webinar, you will be asked to participate in a feedback survey. We would be pleased if you take the time to fill out the survey and help us to optimize our webinars. The link to the recording of today's webinar as well as the presentation will be sent to you in a separate email one day after the webinar. You can also watch the recording of today's webinar a day later on our website under the navigation point webinars or on our Word Electronic YouTube channel. And now I'm giving directly to our speaker, Ismail Molina, and I wish you an exciting webinar. So thank you, Stefan, for the nice introduction. And uh, also thank you to everybody for attending this webinar and also for your patience as we had some technical issues during the starting of the webinar. So when we talk about filtering, as a solution for EMI issues, we are talking not only about building a complete passive filter, but also to uh, about using a ferrite, a club ferrite, or even a common mode choke, as those are typically uh, already a complete filter. A good example of a filter could be just an inductor or a capacitor. For the purpose of this webinar, we will be taking an inductor as a sample. Well, if we were in an ideal world, our filter model will look just like the one in the picture, a simple inductor without any other effect than an inductive effect. But if we, uh, as we know from the theory and also, of course, from the praxis um, and the experience, we are not in an ideal world. We are way far from it. And that means that the component has some parasitic effects. Considering just the easy way to approach the a complete or more or less complete model of our real uh, inductor, we should add first a capacity effect due to the capaci uh, capacitance between the windings and also due to the real losses generated by the magnetic core, we should add some AC losses. These AC losses will be represented by a resistor. We can also see in the model that we have a DC losses. These DC losses will be represented by, the, by a resistor also and are generated by the wire. Let's take a look how uh, the simulation see of an ideal filter and a real or more or less real filter. The simulation has been done with LD spies and we are using our components library for this kind of, uh, for the real LC filter. Here we see the results 
And as we can see, we have two resonances, which means we have two reactive components. Up to 10 megahertz, we could say that we are really close to the ideal behavior of the filter. However, after the first resonance, the difference between the ideal and the real filter becomes much bigger, reaching even the 100 decibels. Here we have an attenuation graph of a real EMI filter measured in the lab. So we see also we have two resonance frequencies uh, for the common mode attenuation, which means we have at least two reactive components having some kind of effect in the common mode uh, in the common mode uh, attenuation. So in this example of, of an EMI filter, we have a, a complete filter with differential mode uh, chokes, common mode chokes, X capacitors, Y capacitors um, on each line. So um, different, different components distributed in the whole filter. And to have an idea about the effect of each component on our common mode and differential mode, we have to divide the filters into two models one for the differential and one for the common. But what exactly means differential mode and common mode? So the differential mode is uh, the transmission mode we have uh, in our signal and in our power line. So this transmission mode means that we, have, uh, we are sending the signal in one of the lines, usually the line, the L line or the plus line, and receiving the field, uh, the the signal back on the neutron line or in the minus line. So we have a controlled return path for our signal or our power, power signal. Common mode is usually the noise we have in our system. As this noise will be coupled in the two lines at the same time, we, we will be having the exact same signal in both lines. So let's have a closer look to the different models and the effect of each part of the filter in the behavior. So this will be a filter that we will be taking as an example where we have one X capacitor, two Y capacitors, one common mode choke, and a bleed resistor for safety reasons. So this bleed resistor is only used for discharging the X capacitor. So we are not taking into account this resistor in our model because it's a really um, high ohm resistor. It's over 10 meg and has almost no influence on the, on the models. So a common mode signal has the same phase and amplitude in both lines at the same time. For this reason, only the common mode choke and the Y capacitor will have some effect in the common mode signal. The X capacitor is not having any effect because we have in both nodes the same amplitude of the signal, so the same voltage, so we are not able to, char to charge our, our capacitor. Opposite to that, a differential mode signal has opposite phase but the same amplitude at the same time in both lines. In this case, each one of the components of the filter is affecting the differential mode signal. But we have to be careful because in this case, the common mode choke is almost no affecting the signal. We have a small effect, but in comparison with the common mode effect is nothing. It's around 1 to 1.5% the effect we had in common mode. And we will see why. So increasing the mismatch between the lines and our filter, it's also a possibility to optimize our filter response. Which means having a high impedance in the line will generate the highest mismatch 
if we place a capacitor, a low impedance, first in our filter. Let us simulate the third filter changing the source and load impedances. So if we simulate the following filter parameterizing the source load with 0 0.1, 50 and 100 ohm and keeping the load impedance with 50 ohm, we should expect to get the better results the higher the source impedance is. And as we expected, the higher source impedance, the better the efficiency has the filter. In this case, we are over 50 dB uh, decibels different in the high frequency. Now we simulate the same filter, but keeping the source impedance at 50 ohm and changing the load impedance between 0 0.1, 50 and 100 ohms. We should expect to have the better performance of the filter with the smallest uh, load impedance. And as expected, we get the results we were uh, waiting for. So with 0 0.1 in comparison with the 100 load impedance, we have over 40 uh, decibels difference. But how is exactly filtering working? And why does Worth Electronic has, have such a big portfolio? Well, filtering is not about black magic. Black magic is only what we used to say when we don't understand how things are working. The impedance of a choke is determined by the number of windings and the material parameters. As a result of the properties of the material, we have a real and an imaginary part of the impedance. The real part represents the losses and the imaginary part represents the energy storing properties of the inductor. So in the following graph, we see the core properties causing the energy storing in an inductive component. The first material we are showing is the iron powder material which is recommended for low frequencies. This iron powder material is an alloy material which has a distributed air gap increasing the saturation properties. That's why it's so recommended for power inductors. In the middle frequency range, we have manganese zinc material, which is a, um, also a, a ferrite component. It's not an alloy component, an alloy material. And it's uh, recommended to be used for power inductor e only if we create an air gap in the inductor. So we can increase the saturation properties of this material. The last one will be nickel zinc, which is a material recommended for the high frequency applications, as the energy storing properties won't be as good as the manganese zinc but will be acting in the highest frequency range. We are here referring mainly to energy storing inductors and transformers, where we intend to have as small as possible losses, but high storing energy capabilities. So using the different materials, we can increase or reduce the working frequency. In the following graph, we have an impedance uh, graph of an power in, a power inductor. So as we see the black and uh, the black curves and the dotted one, they are representing impedance and phase. Uh, well, the magnitude and the phase of the impedance. Red is showing the reactive part of the impedance, and 
the green one is showing the losses, the real losses. So as we can see in the graph, this inductor is purely reactive or as pure as possible uh, could be. So we have a really narrow uh, losses with a really low effect in the impedance score. Only at the resonance, we have the highest effect. That is why we recommend when using power inductor to stay uh, far away from the, from the resonance. So we are able to reduce the losses. In this graph, we can see the material property causing the real losses. Like before, the first material we are showing is an iron powder alloy. This iron powder is not really recommended for filtering, only in case we have differential mode chokes, as the iron powder has really low losses, but a high saturation properties. So what we are looking for in a common mode choke is to have as high as possible losses as we can, but the saturation is not relevant for us, and we will see why. In the middle frequency we find again manganese zinc, which is a really good material for uh, filtering, as it has one of the highest losses we can generate in in this in a common mode choke and is acting in a really interesting frequency range for us for EME, EMI solutions. And the last one will be nickel sync. Nickel sync is recommended for high frequency applications or high frequency filtering as we are not generating such a, a high losses but we are acting in the really high frequency. Of course, the losses of the material can be affected by the amount of oxide that we are, uh, we are mixing during the production process and also by the number of windings. However, changing the material itself will affect directly to the frequency and uh, to the frequency region where we are generating the losses. And now we can compare with a power inductor the losses of a choke. So in this case, we can see the curves are representing the same. So the black ones are representing magnitude and phase of the, of the impedance. The red one is representing the reactive part of the component and the green one is representing the losses. So we can see now that the losses are much more, uh, the bandwidth of the losses is much bigger and also we have higher losses. So besides the core material difference, there are two major types uh, to the current compensating choke, common mode chokes. And it describes how they are wound around the ferrite tor the toroidal. We have a bifilar wound and a sectional wound. So which one is the best one for, for our application? Well, depending on which application do we have and what are we looking for. We can say that the, the bifilar winding style has a much lower impact in the differential mode than the sectional one. The sectional one has a, a higher leakage inductance having a higher impact in the, in the differential mode. So the bifilar winding style is constructed uh, of two parallel conductors which are wound around the ferrite toroid. This has the effect of high common mode impedance or attenuation, but low differential mode impedance. If we look at the sectional wound, we can see that we still have two conductors, but they have been separated. This has the effect of high common mode impedance 
and in addition it also has significantly higher differential mode impedance compared to to that of the bifilar wound version sectional winding style is usually um, used for a higher isolation while the bifilar is used for higher bandwidth Also, temperature dependency is a factor we have to consider. So we can see in the slide the dependency of one of our manganese zinc core with the temperature. So we are really using extreme temperature to see the effect magnified. And the difference could be, in some cases, even half of the impedance. Of course, the biggest difference here is really close to the Curie temperature where our magnetic cores is los losing most of the magnetic effects. But the interesting thing is now take a look to a nanocrystalline core. So a nanocrystalline core is really stable against temperature. And in comparison with manganzing shows a really uh, better performance independently of the temperature. So we are not really depending on the ambient temperature of the choke. The saturation current is a big topic because uh, most of the time a designer coming from the power range, they are asking about the, the saturation because we are used to see this factor or this, this value in the data sheet. But for a choke, this is not a value that we are giving in the datasheet, at least not an, as a an standard. The reason behind is the working principle of the choke. As a choke is compensating the field inside the core, it is not possible to saturate the choke in differential mode. However, as soon as we talk about common mode currents, we see that the choke is saturating really fast. But we do not have to worry about this phenomena, as the currents in common mode are really, really small in comparison with the currents in differential mode. Here we can see a saturation graph of different, of different chokes in differential mode. We mark the rated current limit with dotted lines. We can also see that there is kind of a saturation effect for the WFC, so one of the chokes we are, we are displaying. But this is only caused by the enormous current and the overheating of the choke, which leads to a temperature in the core over the Curie temperature. So this, uh, we have to consider that the rated current for this choke is around 0.6 amps, and we are uh, seeing a saturation effect at 4.5, so we are really over the, the recommended temperature and current. Another phenomenon where the choke could help is not only with the EMI but also with the transients. We developed together with Schneider Electric a method to characterize the effect of our chokes on EFTB signals. This setup will be applied in each of our chokes to find the optimal solution for this situation and this test setup. This is an example of the results we are getting with this test setup. Of course, not only the time domain is analyzed, but also the frequency domain where we can compare if the results are fitting with our small signal analysis, which are the results we are showing in our catalog. So, and that's why we as Worth Electronic have a such big portfolio and we are offering different topologies and core materials for our chokes. If you are interested also in to get more information about the materials, simulations we have been doing during this presentation, you can also check on this toolbox where we have the, 
the basics for magnetics and the basics for LT spy simulation. So thank you very much for your attention and I think we already have a couple of questions that we can answer. So the first question is why the nanocrystalline, ma nanocrystalline material is so stable against temperature in comparison with uh, manganese zinc or nickel zinc? So the nanocrystalline material is not a ferrite material, it's an alloy. And uh, usually the ferrite materials are losing the magnetic uh, properties around 150 to 200 uh, degrees. But in the case of the nanocrystalline material, we are losing the properties at 600 degrees. So it's just an intrinsic property of the material that we are getting thanks to the um, nanocrystallization of the of the materials. And uh, yeah, it's uh, we are having the same effect, but the temperature will be much higher. So I have one question asking why the discontinuity in the in the X in the red graph in the page twenty seven. So allow me to go to the to the slide. So here we are. So we can see that in the in the red graph we are going from a positive value, and now we show a discontinuity. This discontinuity is because we are showing a um, a logarithmic sc uh, scale of the graph. So here we have a reactive part that means which is positive which means we are in inductive range here up to the resonance at the resonance we reach a phase of zero so uh, we have zero also for the reactive part we have no reactive part pure resistive and after the resonance frequency we are in a negative reactive part it means a phase of minus or close to minus 90 as possible which means we have a capacitive effect of the choke we can see there is a discontinuity and here is the graph is continuing because we are back to a positive phase so we have another really interesting question so it's asking about the applications of bifilar winding and sectional winding so the question is more oriented to bifilar winding is better for high speed signal and sectional for power supply. Uh, it's really depending on the application, but yes, if we have a high speed signal, all of our chokes used for high speed signal are bifilar wound. And the sectional ones usually are recommended for power supplies because in a power supply we need uh, an isolation of I don't know depending on the voltage of the of the line so but usually it's 250 if we are directly connecting to the line uh, that's why we recommend to get to get some separation so we can uh, we can pass the safety recommendations which are around 2.5 to 3 millimeters distance between both phases well um, we have another question um, and the question is, it is possible to predict when the choke needs additional damping. Um, so the damping is usually needed for differential mode chokes. Um, as we saw in our graphs, the, differential, the common mode chokes are built with high losses uh, materials. So with this high losses material, we are already uh, building the damping on this choke. So what we do with the damping is just include high losses, resistive losses, so we are not getting into instability of the of the whole system. With the common mode chokes, these real losses are, are already built into the into the core material. So we receive another question um, asking about if it's enough to have a sectional uh, common mode choke to attenuate the common mode and the differential mode. So well, it will be depending on the on the situation or the the EMI the interference you have in, in your system, but usually a sectional common mode choke has a much higher attenuation in differential mode, so that will help uh, into, into reducing the, the, the emissions or um, increasing the, the, the acceptability of interference in your system. So I see there is no, or there are no more open questions. In case you have any other question, 
please do not hesitate to to address us to the email you already get from us so we will try to answer the question as soon as possible thank you very much for your attention and your time and have a nice day <laughs>